So now that I have the announcements out of the way, I want to give you, uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the Online Media Legal Network, which is an initiative of the Berkman Center that we launched in January. Um, the network grew out of the work we've been doing over the past three years at the Citizen Media Law Project. Uh, with funding from the Knight Foundation, um, Citizen Media Law Project set out to provide a broad range of educational material addressing the legal issues online publishers are likely to face. Everything from forming a business uh, to responding to subpoenas. Um, while the legal guide and videos we produced have been very popular, we quickly realized that no amount of legal training could substitute for a real live lawyer on the other end of the phone, especially when you're facing a subpoena or a summons and complaint. In those first few years, we leaned a lot on the cyber law clinic at Harvard Law School and on an informal network of lawyers we knew from our years in practice. It quickly became apparent, however, that we couldn't keep up with the many requests that we were receiving. But we also knew from our time in private practice that there were a lot of lawyers out there who wanted to work with these journalism startups and other digital media creators. It just isn't easy to make that connection. I mean, after all, if you're a client, a prospective client and you need legal help, there's no heading in the yellow pages for pro bono media lawyer. So, so we created the online media le legal network to serve as a bridge between the clients who desperately needed legal assistance and the lawyers who wanted to help. Now to make this work, we knew we had to make it as easy as possible for the lawyers to find clients that matched their interests and practice areas. Um, being the technologists that we are, we built a website, or I should say the uh, tech folks at the Berkman Center built an amazing website for us to make this all happen. And all of the members of the network have profiles on the site where they can identify whether they're interested in transactional work or litigation work and their areas of expertise and geographical limitations. When they log on to the website or receive our bi-weekly email listing open client matters, they automatically see a list of best matches for them. Um, in an interview I did the other day talking about our work, a reporter referred to the network as a matchmaking service for lawyers and clients. That's, that's a somewhat apt description, um, or I guess it would be if the dating service sent out screeners to meet with all of the participants to make sure they were up to snuff. And that gets to one of the most important things we do at the Online Media Legal Network. Through the uh, work, the hard work of Kim Isbell and Helen Fu, every client who comes to us is rigorously screened. This accomplishes several functions. First, we evaluate each prospective client to make sure they're suitable in the first place for the network. We know we can't help everyone. Uh, we, we try to expend our limited resources on clients that are economically viable and sustainable over time, that adhere to journalistic standards, that are at the forefront of efforts to harness the internet to improve journalism and fill unmet information needs, that create their own original reporting, or that use traditional news sources in new and innovative ways, and most importantly, clients that seek to serve the public interest through their work. Mind you, these are just guidelines, and we try to apply them liberally, but they serve as an excellent way for us to identify prospective clients that should be given priority in the network. But we don't just stop there. Kim and Helen also screen each prospective client to determine their financial eligibility for pro bono or reduced fee legal services. For those clients whose income or revenue are above the pro bono financial cutoffs, which we describe on our site, um, our members are free to negotiate uh, fee arrangements that's acceptable to both parties. As you'd imagine, all of this takes a lot of time, and Kim and Helen get to know the clients and their projects very well. Um, this makes it possible for them to really understand the client's legal needs, and they use that understanding to create easily digestible client matter summaries um, so that members can uh, quickly decide whether this is a client they want to work with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we formally launched the network in January of this year, and let me give you a brief rundown of what the network looks like today after three months. We now have over 110 members, including law firms, law school clinics, in-house counsel, and individual lawyers. I know many of you in the room are members. Um, we have members with offices or practices in 34 states, although we don't yet have anyone from Connecticut, Michigan, or New Mexico, which is kind of odd. Um, both places where you'd expect uh, there to be a lot of clients, and in fact, we do get clients from those states. So if you know any lawyers uh, in those states who should be members, please tell them to join. More importantly, let me tell you a little bit about the clients because they're really what the network is all about. Uh, over the past three months, we've had we've, uh, have more than 100 matters come into the network from 38 different clients. And these clients have come from 16 states. And the work they have has been very diverse. We've been able to help three clients find lawyers to defend them against defamation lawsuits. Three clients have received help with news gathering issues. Three clients have found lawyers who are now providing pre-publication review for them. And one client is receiving help with a FOIA dispute. But lest you think all of the work is litigation-oriented, the network has helped 
A dozen clients get help with drafting terms and conditions and privacy policies for their websites. Five clients have received help with intellectual property counseling and nine clients have received help with business entity formation. That's just a few of the things that the network has, uh, has helped with. I should say all of you have helped with. Um, in order to put a human face on these statistics, um, we created a client brochure in your registration packets. It uh, looks like this. that describes five of the clients who have received help through the network. And I'll let you skim the book on your own. But I want to mention that representatives of two of those clients, two of the clients profiled in the book, are here today. Uh, I won't ask them to stand up, um, but I will tell you a little bit about them. Um, mapping Main Street documents Main Streets all across America using stories, music, photos, and videos to create an interactive map of the country. The project's goal is to highlight the diverse narratives and conceptions of Main Street and to challenge the understanding of the, the use of the term Main Street as embodying a single set of values, social backgrounds, or common economic interests. Mapping Main Street is, is create, was created by ha two Harvard PhD students, Jesse Shapins and James Burns. Both of them are here today. And with public media artists Kara Oler and Ann Hepperman. In addition to recording and taking photographs and video of the main streets they've visited, Jesse and James have designed an online platform for citizens to share their own stories, images, and videos. Mapping Main Street also has produced a series of stories that recently aired on NPR's Weekend Edition Saturday. We also have Beth Harris and Steven Zucker here today from smarthistory.org. Smart History is a free multimedia web-based art history compendium. The website presents information on works of art by juxtaposing short essays and images and discussions about the art. The project began in 2005 as a series of podcasts for the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art and has since expanded to become a compendium of art history online. In 2009, smarthistory.org won the Webby Award for Best Educational Website and was picked by PC Magazine as one of the top 100 websites. Now mind you, these are just two of the exceedingly cool clients that we have in the network. And all of them have fascinating legal work that could use your help, <coughs> that they could use your help with. So if you're a lawyer and you haven't yet joined the online media network, legal network, please consider joining today. We have forms at the registration table where you came in and you can fill them out in less, fewer than 10 minutes. And if you're a law student, and many of the folks here I think uh, fall into that category, um, and you're about to graduate and join a law firm, ask whether your firm is a member of the network. It would be a great way for you to get some pro bono hours under your belt and feel good while you're doing it. Before I close, I want to thank <coughs> Dow Lonis, Prince, Lobel, Glosky, and Ty, and Warmer Hale for sponsoring the conference and the work of the Online Media Legal Network. It's staff and resource intensive to run the network, and we are deeply grateful to our sponsors and to the Knight Foundation who make our work possible. If you would like to be a sponsor of the network, please try to find me at lunch or at the cocktail reception at the end of the day. So let's get started with the conference. Our first panel today will address hot news, copyright fair use, and news aggregation. Chris Bavitz, who is the assistant director of the Cyber Law Clinic, will be moderating, and I'll let him take over. Thank you. <laughs> 